forgive me while I just turn this camera around and hopefully get it pointed in the right place to capture talking to you. And it's the words that matter here, not the image of me on my cycle um, ride. I have to choose, choose, choose a location carefully to read this out because it's a, you know, a distressing kind of case that you don't want other, other people listening into. Um, it's case 39, and case 39, um, sorry, it's from the post custody on license section, rape, communication between brother and sister. So um, the background is that an 18 year old raped his 13 year old sister. The victim and her mother sought communication with the offender. Sean, aged 18 at the time of the offence, was convicted a year later of raping his sister, Daniela, who was aged 13 at the time of the offence. Sean, after being held on remand, was sentenced to two years in custody and an extended licence period of two years on probation supervision. When released from custody, Sean was discharged to a probation hostel. The probation officer referred the case to mediators. Two mediators worked on this case throughout. Sean's mother, Sandra, had been in contact with the probation service because she had not had any contact with her son since the offence. Sean's mother said that Daniela wanted to meet with Sean. Sandra said that Daniela wanted to meet him to tell him how, she, how sad she'd felt and how she needed to move on. The first contact between the mediators and Daniela took place after communication with her social worker, who checked that Daniela was willing to see the mediators. When Daniela was visited at home, she said she wanted to establish contact with her brother to ask him why he raped her. She also wanted him to know that he is still her brother and she loves him, but doesn't like what he did to her. She also wanted to hear him admit to having raped her. She said she needed this to help her move on. The mediators later agreed that they had picked up a feeling that she felt guilty about reporting him because he had then served a prison sentence. It had been important to stress to Daniela during the first visit that mediation was a voluntary process and that she needed to prepare herself for the fact that Sean might not want anything to do with her, that he might still be in denial of the offence and Daniela might not get to hear what she expected to hear and wanted to hear. She accepted that. The mediators went to visit Sean in the probation hostel with his support worker from the hostel present. The support worker had told us before the visit that Sean was very distressed by the offence and the sentence and was also very anxious about seeing his sister in town. Sean had questions of his own that he wanted to ask. Sean did not deny that he had had sex with his 13 year old sister but maintained that it was consensual. Despite having pleaded guilty in court he could not accept that he was guilty of rape because he felt she instigated the situation and gave out the wrong signals. During the visit, the mediation process was explained to him that it is voluntary and that the referral had come from Daniela via her social worker and that had gone through the probation officer. Sean was told that mediators were not in judgment of either party. At that point, he relaxed a little. Later on in the discussion, Sean expressed his view that rape is a violent act on a stranger, for example, in a park, that he didn't think he had been violent or unpleasant to Daniela. He didn't consider himself a rapist. The dialogue then involved explaining to Sean that rape is not necessarily violent, but that it is non-consensual. In discussing the concept of consent, Sean was left to think about whether in her own mind, Daniela had consented. Sean then said that in his mind, what he'd done was wrong. What he'd done that was wrong was just that he'd had sex with his sister. He also claimed that Daniela was having another intra-family sexual relationship. The mediators clarified that whether Daniela had had sex with another family member was not relevant to Sean being charged with rape because she hadn't reported it. He had been charged with rape because Daniela had reported that he had had non-consensual sex with her. The mediators then relayed messages from Daniela that she still loved him and that she valued him as a brother. There was also the message from Sean's mother that she still loved him and that she'd agreed that she wouldn't try and hit him if he agreed to a meeting with his sister. At that point, Sean began to cry and said that he missed his family. At this point, the mediators chose to take a break. After the break, 
Sean said that the time to think about all these issues, that he needed time to think about all these issues because he was confused and needed time to sort out his own feelings. The visit ended by establishing the arrangements for a further visit from the mediators. At the second visit to Sean, he expressed that he wanted his family to know that he changed his plea from not guilty to guilty because he didn't want the family put through more pain and torn apart by court appearances. If Sean had pleaded not guilty, his sister would have had to have gone to court. He had said to a solicitor that he was saving his sister from having to give evidence and that by admitting guilt, he was able to protect the family. Sean went on to say that he wanted to ask of his mother why she had not visited him whilst in prison. He said that all the time he was in there, nobody visited him. The dialogue between the mediators and Sean relayed the family feelings towards him now and Sean became more upset. Sean wanted to express what he had lost and express all his feelings about what had happened since he was charged. After talking about his experience of being in custody, Sean asked if he would be able to phone his mother. Sean wanted to know how his family was and asked if he had, if had, sorry, if the mediators had seen his younger brother. Sean said that he didn't think he would be able to cope with any meeting with his sister because he was ashamed and he wanted the family to know that he loved them all and missed them. The mediators agreed with Sean that they would go and see his mother separately because they had got separate issues and would get back to Sean once they had seen his mother and sister again. So now we have a section called mediation with Sean's mother. The mediators then explained to Sean's mother how he felt and she later contacted the mediators to give them a mobile phone into which she'd programmed her own mobile phone number so he could ring her on this without the rest of the family knowing. The mediators passed this phone to Sean's probation officer who made sure the phone reached Sean. This communication channel was made possible by the mediators having told Sean's mother that he was upset, had cried and that he still loved her, missed her and wanted to know why she hadn't visited him. Sean's mother wanted to be able to talk to her son and a direct route of communication was established so that they were able to say what they needed to say to one another. The mediators saw no more role for themselves in relation to Sean's mother. Though they had tried to encourage everybody to be open and for Sean's mother to tell Daniela that she had given Sean a mobile phone. She wouldn't though and the mediators had to go along with this because that was her wish. It would have been a lot easier if the family were open about things, but the family had a tradition of secrecy about everything. The mediator's next, village, mediator's next visit to Daniela relayed to her that he admitted what he had done to her was wrong and his acceptance, and that what he had had difficulty accepting was that it was a rape. The mediators were clear that there was a highly problematic lack of congruence in the accounts of what had happened. Total congruence is unrealistic before a face-to-face -face mediation. However, in this case, there are a number of reasons why a face-to-face -face meeting was inappropriate. The mediators thought that the differences were too great and couldn't be resolved, and Sean did not want a face-to-face -face meeting. Also, the mediators felt that there were greater gains for all parties possible by continuing the indirect mediation. The mediators discussed with Daniela how futile a meeting would be if one party was willing and the other one wasn't. Daniela kept saying that she just wanted to ask Sean a couple of things. So the mediators asked her again what it was she wanted and she went over the point of why Sean had done it. The mediators said that Sean had already answered that question. Daniela wanted Sean to have some photos of the family and so passed these to the mediators. When these were passed to the probation hostel, the probation service policy meant that Sean was not allowed to be given any photos of his sister as the victim. Daniela was informed that Sean had gladly received the family photographs that she had sent him, but was disappointed that the staff would not let Sean have the photos of her. The mediators explained that the staff were responsible for protecting victims and were applying a rule that they would apply for any other rape victim whose photos would not be allowed in a probation hostel. Sean had been distressed at the hostel when others had asked him why he had a picture of his mother, dad and brothers by his bed, but none of his sister. The information was relayed to Daniela at the final visit. The mediators decided to draw the mediation to a close because no one was saying anything which implied that progress could be made on the differences in the accounts of the offence. By this stage, Sean had moved out of the probation hostel. The mediators informed Sean that Daniela still sent 
the message that she loved him and hoped they could both meet sometime. The mediators reminded him that he was still on licence and had a responsibility not to approach her should they meet in the street. Sean said he was pleased about that because he liked clarity about what he could and couldn't do. Sean had moved and he wanted his new telephone number to be passed on to the rest of the family so they could ring him. The family were aware that direct contact between Sean and his sister was prohibited, but still not aware of the direct telephone link between Sean and his mother. Sean's sentence was completed in 2003 after two years on licence. So now we come to the reflections which were put together Unless, this, unless some of these reflections are by the practitioner, it would have been myself and Marion Liebman who m made these reflections on the case. Indirect mediation is sometimes more appropriate than face-to-face -face mediation. The use of indirect mediation enabled more bridges to be built than if it had been a direct mediation, in which case the different view of the offence could have broken down the communication that had been built up. Secondly, this case progressed by the mediators being flexible in addressing presenting issues. There had been a number of missed appointments and some unscheduled visits to the mediator's office. Thirdly, there was no happy ending to this case, but some progress was made in enabling Sean and his family to have some contact. Fourthly, without direct contact, the victim was able to pass on her love for her brother. Fifthly, Sean had got the assurance that his family still loved him. Next, Sean was able to have a different understanding that non-consensual sex is rape. This is a vital understanding for all young men to learn in their sexual relationships. Next, had the mediator's contact with the victim led to the acknowledgement of another offence, then further steps would have been taken. If a mediator hears of an offence against a child, they must take action and report it. It is always necessary to report an alleged offence to a mediator's supervisor, and the supervisor can make the decision about reporting it on.